Okay, so this morning what we're going to be dealing with is the question of the development of the piano, really from the time of Mozart through Beethoven, uh, through Chopin, and through Liszt up to the modern grand piano that you see in front of us. And we'll end with a guest performer. Uh, Dan Schlosswerkberg will be coming in about 11 o'clock and we'll be talking with Dan at that point. Uh, we start with Mozart because he was the first composer to switch from the harpsichord over to the piano. The harpsichord was the primary instrument, of course, of the Baroque period, as we said before, 1600 to 1750. Now, our first slide that we see on the screen this morning is a Dutch harpsichord, comes from the Low Countries, of the 17th century. It's actually in our own collection of historical musical instruments at 17 Hill House Avenue, and many of the slides um, that we'll, we will be seeing today come from that particular collection. So if you ever happen to be sick and going over to DUH, right next to DUH on this side of the railroad tracks or the canal there is this splendid collection of, of keyboard instruments. Uh, you got a chance, I believe, um, in section last time to deal with uh, the harpsichord and perhaps even play the harpsichord. And you remember that it produces this kind of tinkling, jangling effect, right? So if you ever hear a tingling, jangling keyboard instrument on a test, what are you going to say about musical style? What period does it come from? Daniel? Baroque, okay? So that's a good key. It's one of the fingerprints for uh, Baroque music. But young Mozart here, about 1770 to 1780, he, be he came to prefer uh, the, the piano because what was the one limitation or a central limitation of the harpsichord? What, what was the problem in the essence with the harpsichord? Uh, nice and loud. Kristen, isn't it? I can hardly see back there. Kristen, nice and loud? No dynamics, okay? Basically, you get one dynamic level. Yeah, you can throw some levers and maybe bring some more stri strings in, but it's cumbersome. You can't shade all a scale. You can't re reach for a climax. It's not only dynamics, it's shading that's also very important there. So people began to switch over to this thing called the pianoforte. Originally, it was all one word, pianoforte, the loud soft or the soft, loud pianoforte, so that uh, there could be gradations of, of sound. And this was an instrument invented in Florence around 1700. Actually, we know the name of the person that did it, Bartolomeo Cristofori. I didn't put that up on the board, uh, but uh, that's what happened in Florence around 1700. And it took about 50 years or so before this to kind of catch on, this invention to catch on and gradually uh, replace the harpsichord. But notice that when we, when we have our first pianos, that they look virtually identical to the harpsichord. Here is a harpsichord from our collection. Here is a piano uh, for, of the sort that Mozart would have played about 1770. So it's not that much bigger, right? Go back and forth quickly, uh, if you would, Jacob. There's the harpsichord, and there's the piano. And as said, Mozart was the first com significant composer to switch from the harpsichord to the piano. Mozart, of course, came from the city of Salzburg, Austria, uh, and he was an employee, a sort of disgruntled employee, of the Archbishop of Salzburg. He referred to the Archbishop as the Archbooby. Uh, and Mozart is thought to be uh, a composer who worked at the piano. Uh, and indeed, uh, so was Joseph Haydn, Mozart's uh, contemporary and dear, dear friend. It's Mozart that first called Haydn Papa Haydn. Uh, so let's go on to two slides here. We've got a couple to skip. And here is Haydn. He's composing, thinking things through at a keyboard. And here is Mozart uh, working at a keyboard. But Mozart actually didn't compose at a keyboard. What, why, why is he then seated at a keyboard? To show that he's a musician. You need an icon to associate, it, to associate it with. When Mozart composed, you know where he did most of his composing? Some of it at a billiard table, but most of it in bed. His sister tells us that and his wife tells us that. He would get up in the morning and he would just stay in bed. And he had this kind of desk with ink trays and sand and stuff to blot the paper and he would work in bed. 
from about 7 to 10 in the morning. He didn't need a piano. He heard it all, all in his head. In any event, 1781, Mozart has had it with the arch booby of Salzburg. He breaks free of him and establish him, establishes himself as a freelance musician in the city of Vienna. This was kind of a risky gambit to be a freelance musician. Um, we have two freelance musicians in our midst today, Santana and Jacob. Um, how is it, Santana, being a freelance musician? Busy. Busy. What do you have to do? Run around to different gigs, right? Trying to, to patch together a living as best you can until you work your way up to a more secure position. Same thing, I'm sure, with, with Jacob. Well, what did Mozart do when he got to Vienna then? How was he going to patch together a living? He did it through two, uh, two ways. One, he was going to um, uh, give piano piano lessons to the aristocracy, going to give piano lessons to the aristocracy, and two, he was going to uh, play the piano in public concerts, teacher, performer. And as a result of this, he perfected or contributed greatly to two important genres in the history of music, those genres being the piano sonata, We've talked about the sonata, usually three movements. Uh, those he wrote mostly for his pupils. And then the piano concerto, Mozart wrote 23 original piano concertos. The piano concerto, which he wrote principally for himself as a kind of showpiece for public concerts. And you will be watching in section beginning this evening a wonderful video of the performance of the great D minor piano concerto of Mozart. Um, Mozart's uh, piano concertos are much more difficult than uh, his uh, sonatas. Uh, he intended these piano concertos for he himself, no, for him himself, I guess so, for him you know, to play. Um, and he did so, interestingly enough, at this public hall that was located in the casino in Vienna. Here's a picture of that casino which today is actually the, it's this building to the right there, the tallest one. It's a big building and it had a big public space in it and that's where he performed. Uh, it still exists, that building still exists. It's the Ambassador Hotel in downtown in the Neumark uh, plots there in, um, in Vienna. Uh, why did Mozart play in a casino? I was driving down the highway the other day and I saw a sign up there, Usher at Mohegan Sun. My wife thought this might be a Poe play, a, you know, but uh, who is Usher? Raps artist? Do, is a musician, right? No? Who's Usher? Come on, guys. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Frederick, nice and loud, please. An R&B singer, but he's playing the casinos because that's where the money is, okay? That's where the money is. That's where the crowd is. That's where the money is. And Mozart was doing this back in the 18th century as well. The other venue that he played, I think I've got a slide of this. Jacob, let's take a look at this, is the local court theater, the Burg Theater. It wasn't that big. It was about the size of our own Sprague Hall here, Morse Recital uh, Hall inside of Sprague Hall. Seated about uh, 18, excuse me, 800 people. And for this, Mozart would have to uh, hire the orchestra. He would have to compose the music. He would have to print the tickets. He would have to sell the tickets out of his own apartment. And uh, he would have to transport his own piano over to this hall um, to uh, uh, provide the instrument for him to play. Let's take a look at this piano of Mozart. So here is a piano of Mozart. It's a very small instrument, as you can see. Its compass is only five octaves, F to F. Um, so it, it uh, and it has only one string per key. If you go up to the modern grand and actually look at it, you'll, you hit middle C. There are actually three strings up there that get struck by that hammer. But in Mozart's piano, there'd only be one. It's much smaller in a number of different ways. Now, um, let's take a listen to, let's listen to a performance on Mozart's piano. 
And I emphasize here, this is not a replica of a piano that, that Mozart, of Mozart's day. This is Mozart's own piano. After he died, it went to his widow, who gave it to uh, the eldest son, and ultimately it came in to, uh, back into Salzburg and is today in the Wohnungshaus there in Salzburg. So this is the real piano, uh, and we're going to hear a performance of the famous sonata in C major. So let's listen to a little bit of Mozart's own piano. Stop it there. Yum. Notice that Mozart's piano, yum, that piece he was in the dominant there at the end of the first thing, yum. No, it was yum. That's the pitch at which Mozart's piano is tuned and probably pretty close to what it was tuned in his own day. So he was writing it in the key of G, which is here, but it's, they, it is sounding for our ears. There. Is that higher or lower, Mozart's, the tuning of Mozart's instrument? Here's what he wrote it for. Here's what it is sounding. Higher or lower? What do you think? How many say higher? Raise your right hand. How many say lower? Raise your left hand. Interesting. Uh, it's actually lower, yeah. It's down a half a step. And that was typical. I think we talked about that before. The tuning kind of floated around up until really the 20th century when it got, sort of got fixed that A should be at 440 vibrations per, per second. So that's Mozart's own piano. What did you think about the sound of it? Any adjectives there? Somebody tell me something about the sound of Mozart's piano. Play, play the beginning again. If, are, are you still there on that one? Okay. Give me two adjectives about this sound. Someone give me a shout out an adjective. Shallow. Uh, uh, Sarah? Shallow. Shallow. Okay, it doesn't have a lot of resonance. It does not have, it's not a big, rich sound. Um, so the, the sound dissipates very quickly because there's not a lot of resonators around that instrument. So we'll take shallow. Give me another adjective. Uh, Roger. Pungent. Pungent, okay, kind of sharp, pungent you said? Punchy. Oh, I like that even better. Uh, punchy. Yes. Uh, and I put the word up there, staccato, as opposed to legato. Mozart's piano does not um, lend itself to legato lines, these lines that are tied together. Think of your ligature, right? It's all, uh, all etymologically related to um, uh, the word legare, I suppose. Uh, so a legato, smooth, connected. Uh, but that's not the sound that we get in Mozart's piano. We get this staccato, as Roger says, punchy sound. Da, 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 da. So, uh, and it's because the hammers are actually made of leather, kind of hard leather, rather than felt. In the 19th century, they put felt on these hammers, and it kind of smooths it out a bit. We, it makes it less punchy. So those are a couple characteristics of Mozart's piano. It tends to encourage fast staccato playing. All right, 1791, Mozart dies. Beethoven had been originally sent to Vienna to study with Mozart, but then there were family problems. His mother died back in Bonn, so he had to go back and kind of look after the family. Beethoven, like Mozart, was a pianist, but unfortunately for Beethoven, his teacher was his father, a somewhat unscrupulous individual who tried to pass off the rather short Beethoven as being two years younger than he actually was. Why would he want to do that? Well, oftentimes you get kids, you know, the cutoff in particular, so 12 and under soccer or USTA tennis, you're supposed to, you can't be 16 before that particular date and people try to sneak over the other side of it. Uh, well, because 
in terms of the music of Beethoven here, the father wanted the son to be the next wunderkind, right? The next child prodigy, the next Mozart. Why? Because money was to be made in that fashion. The Mozart family had certainly made enough of it that way. But eventually, Beethoven broke free of this tyrannical environment in Bonn and established himself permanently in Vienna. Think about it, Bonn is at the very west end of the German-speaking lands. Vienna is off toward the east end of the German-speaking lands. So he went all the way to the other side of it, but Vienna, of course, was the musical capital of the world at that particular, particular point. So here is what Beethoven, young Beethoven, looked like when he arrived in Vienna uh, permanently about 1797. Ah, forget it. We'll, 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 I forgot that slide, but it doesn't matter. Let's look at Beethoven here. Here's young Beethoven, and here is middle-aged Beethoven when he is writing things such as uh, the uh, um, uh, Eighth Symphony that we uh, uh, heard at the JE concert. So we have Beethoven, young Beethoven, middle-aged, and Beethoven dead. Okay, that's Beethoven's death mask. The only reason I mention this is that it was drawn by Joseph Donhäuser, who also was the artist who painted the cover of your textbook. We'll come back to, come back to that uh, just a little bit later. So when Beethoven, let's, uh, that, that, that's too ghoulish. Let's go back to Beethoven looking a little better there. I, I, I like that better, don't you? So uh, with that vision of Beethoven on the, uh, on the screen, uh, let's make the point that when he arrived in Vienna, he sort of astonished the aristocracy by the power of his play, the aggressive nature of it, the physicality of it, the virtuosity of it. It was much more technical than anything that, uh, that Mozart uh, had ever created on the piano. And in part because gradually in this period, the piano itself was getting bigger and more powerful. So here is, let's move on now, over dead Beethoven's body here and over to this piano, which again comes from our own collection of musical instruments. It's a Kernega piano of about, um, I think we know exactly, 1799, uh, and it was made in Vienna two doors down the, down the street from where that casino was. That's where the Kernega shop was in, in, um, in Vienna. So this is the kind of instrument that Beethoven would have played when he first arrived in uh, Vienna. Uh, it's a little bit bigger. It's got a few more keys added to it. Uh, then in 1817, Beethoven, uh, well, let me, let's move to the next slide. I, I want to show this to you just for a moment. This, does this look like something from the early 19th century? Picture of Beethoven? Actually not. It was created in the 1920s, not 1820s, but 1920s. It's a fanciful representation of Beethoven and, and his uh, musical study there with papers all around. You see the ear trumpets on either side. He's growing deaf. You see his bowl of coffee or porridge or whatever on the keyboard. I'm interested here particularly in the piano because what, what do we have back there coming out of the piano? A lot of broken strings, okay? Uh, and that's kind of important because when he played, um, he would frequently break strings. Here, let's move on to uh, the next slide. It's a, also something of a fanciful representation of Beethoven's room with the idea of the moonlight and the moonlight sonata behind it, but it, uh, it contains as a piano um, an illustration of a Broadwood piano. In 1817, the maker Broadwood gave Beethoven a free instrument, gave Beethoven a free instrument. Um, why would somebody do that? Aren't these pianos expensive? Let's go on to, I think I have a shot of another, uh, another one. This is not fanciful. This is Beethoven's actual instrument. Uh, it is preserved today. It was purchased after Beethoven's death by Franz Liszt, the famous pianist, and taken to ultimately to Budapest. And you can go into, I did this two summers ago, you can go into the, the National Museum there in, in Budapest, and it's actually in Pest, and see this particular instrument. So, so it still survives. And as you can see, it's getting bigger and more powerful. But why would this maker, English maker Broadwood give Beethoven a free instrument? These are expensive. What? Nice and loud. Probably what? Publicity, yeah. A celebrity endorsement, right? Why does Tiger Woods drive a Buick? Do you think he really wants to drive a Buick? 
Okay, uh, but he, nonetheless in TV commercials he's seen driving a Buick, a celebrity endorsement, and we'll be talking a little more uh, about that. So this is Beethoven's, uh, Beethoven's Broadwood here, 18, 1817, still existing today. Let's listen to a little bit of it. We can make recordings, P specialists are allowed to make recordings on it. So here is Beethoven's instrument, just a little bit of, out of a piece of this period by Beethoven. Maybe we'll pause it there. So do you like that sound? Would you like to have, a, uh, have that piano in your house? Maybe, maybe not. A lot of you are shaking your heads. It sounds slightly out of tune to me. Um, and I think maybe the reason is that often with Beethoven's piano, there are two strings per note. It's really hard to get two strings exactly in tune. One string is what it is. Three strings, you get the kind of homogenization of sound. Two strings, it's a bit more difficult. I think it's the same thing with singers, oddly, too. When you're singing, singing with two people, uh, it's a little more difficult to tune up. One or three, it's not, a, not an issue. So it does have this slightly out of tune uh, sound to it. But nonetheless, that is Beethoven's Broadwood piano. Uh, what did Beethoven write for the piano? Well, 32 piano sonatas, 32 piano sonatas, and five piano concertos, most famous of, of which, uh, and I put this on your, remember I gave you uh, the essential Beethoven sheet a couple of weeks ago, the most important of these piano concertos is the so-called Emperor Concerto. So we have the Emperor Quartet by Haydn, the Emperor Concerto by Beethoven. So Beethoven wrote five piano concertos, 32 piano sonatas, and these piano sonatas were not so much, like Mozart's, uh, teaching pieces. These were um, virtuosic pieces for Beethoven himself to play. Uh, how well did he play them? Well, you would think that he would play them absolutely superbly, but that, uh, uh, Contemporaries commented that his playing was kind of messy. Here's what one of them said, quote, his playing is not clean. He has much fire, but he pounds a bit too much. He overcomes diabolical difficulties, but he does not do so neatly. Maybe, possibly, why might Beethoven have trouble as a performer here in the uh, early uh, 1800s? What was Beethoven's issue? Uh, Caroline? He was going deaf. So if he pounded a bit too much, perhaps it's understandable. But here's the kind of sound, perhaps, oh lordy, um, here's the kind of sound that, that uh, uh, the commenter might have had in mind, Beethoven pounding. exaggerating a little bit to get across that, that idea. Two points, I guess. One, what the piano could do for you, these extreme dynamics, and two, perhaps Beethoven, because of his growing deafness, was pounding uh, a, a bit too much. Uh, after Beethoven, pianos only continued to get larger and more powerful. Let's take a look at some of these uh, later uh, instruments. We're moving on now to a graph piano. Graf was another maker who gave Beethoven an instrument. Uh, this uh, comes, uh, my own shot, from the collection of historical musical instruments in Vienna uh, itself. As time goes on here, what we find is that in order f as this instrument gets bigger and we want a bigger soundboard, soundboard 
that thing underneath. That's the main resonator, okay? Uh, we need a bigger soundboard. And as this thing gets bigger and we want to put more tension on these strings to really pound so they don't break them or they don't come loose, we need some kind of iron support. So first they started putting pieces of iron and then ultimately an entire frame, a bed of iron, cast iron underneath that thing for that soundboard to rest in. Then we need the, at the other end, we need a pin block. Uh, and that pin block has to be very secure because that's where the pins that anchor the uh, strings are going to be. Most of the problems, if you, if you think you've got a deal on the piano sometime, check your pin block because you probably don't. Uh, it probably has cracks in it and then you go to tighten that thing to get, get your instrument tuned. The next day it's back out of tune because that pin block is not holding. Uh, so you have to have a very secure pin block, you have to have a, a big resonator and, and in order for that to be helped along you need the cast iron frame underneath. All of these things allow for a bigger, more powerful uh, instrument uh, to be uh, put into play. So this is a graph, as I say, from the collection in Vienna. Uh, the, the range of the instrument is getting bigger, the sound of the instrument is getting bigger. Let's go on to the next slide here. Here's young Franz Schubert. Uh, about your age, young Franz Schubert, writing the kinds of pieces that we used in the review section, for example. And here's the piano that he was playing, also a graft instrument in the Schubert Museum there uh, in, in Vienna. The graft instrument was also given not only to Schubert and to Beethoven, but also to Franz Liszt. Uh, let's take a look at this, uh, uh, another graph. Let's move on to this. This, of course, is what? Where have you seen this before? Cover of the textbook. What is this? This is a marketing tool. Did these people that included Georges Saint, uh, Alexandre Dumas, Père, Victor Hugo, Rossini, uh, Paganini, did they ever come together and pose for this? No, they were in completely different cities. This is a, this is a, a marketing thing. I was looking at a Brooks Brothers thing that seemed, to, it seemed to be shot in Princeton, but if you look carefully, it had all of these brown leaves on the thing and the people had been patched in there and uh, the trees around the thing, they were all in bloom. I mean, this is, this is a hodgepodge. Well, this is a hodgepodge too. Um, but it's kind of an interesting one because it, it tells us um, a little bit about what the 19th century thought of Beethoven. Let's go to this last slide here. So here's Franz Liszt, the famous Franz Liszt playing the piano. He has the historian Marie d'Agoul uh, at, at his knees there in a typical 19th century supplicatory position for women. And up at the top, who do we have? The bust of Beethoven in Olympian height, sort of looking down over the proceeding, blessing Liszt and most importantly, blessing the graft piano. Well, Liszt did uh, play a graft uh, piano. Um, let's listen to, and we're going to have a slide here, Franz Liszt. Let's go on to the next slide. Oh, no. Well, there's one other, uh, one other composer I should mention that's a wonderful composer. I don't have time to do, do anything really with him in, in this course, but he's one of my favorite, Frederick Chopin. Here's Chopin playing a Playel piano, and we have over at our collection a Playel, right, not his piano, but right from the period uh, that he was, he was playing. Uh, and let's go on now. It should be the portrait of... Ah, I got him out of order. Do, all right, let's go on to the portrait of Liszt here. Portrait of Liszt. Here is Franz Liszt, uh, and let's go back one now. And here is an Erard piano that Liszt played. Uh, he actually, it's actually in the collection of Buckingham Palace, um, but when Liszt went there and played for, the Queen, for Queen Victoria, uh, he played on this particular Erard instrument. So it looks very much like a, uh, like a modern instrument. Let's hear just a little bit of Liszt's music. You have it as CD4 uh, track one. It's a transcendental etude, a sort of hugely difficult technical study by Franz Liszt. Let's listen to just a bit of Liszt playing.
So this is called a study. Um, there's some irony here. It's called a study in order you, you, you play this piece and you get better, okay? Now how good would you have to be to begin with to play this piece? Holy schmoly. I mean, this is really difficult technically. Dan, have you ever played a Liszt Transcendental Etude? Oh, he has. Oh, we should have gotten him to play a Liszt Transcendental Etude. It's kind of the top of the line. My guess is in Liszt's day there are probably six or, six or seven people in all of Europe that could actually play these studies that were designed to get you to be a more proficient pianist. You were kind of out of the game before the game even began in an odd way. Um, so, um, this is Liszt's uh, Erard piano. Um, I want to show just a couple more slides and then we'll introduce our guest. Uh, and we've seen the portrait of Liszt. Uh, I was struck when, uh, at the Liszt Museum in Budapest that when you walk in there and you see that Liszt played in his home, and there it is, it's a big instrument with two pedals down there. Um, it's a chickering instrument. And you know where that instrument was made? In Boston. So Boston was a major, and New York also here in the 1860s, 1870s, major manufacturing uh, company, and they shipped one all the way to Budapest uh, for, for Liszt uh, to play. Um, and a, a fine, fine piano indeed. Uh, a couple more and then we're go going to stop. Uh, and of course, when Liszt died, they were particularly not so much interested in doing a, a death mask of his face, but one of his hand, because he was thought to have a very unusual sort of webbing between his fingers that allowed him to stretch in ways that other pianists couldn't. A uh, few more, and then, as I say, we'll stop. This is an interesting piano. Um, Liszt's father-in-law was Richard Wagner. You can read about all about this in the textbook. Liszt's father-in-law was Richard Wagner. And Wagner uh, composed at the piano. Mozart generally didn't, but Wagner did. Uh, and this is the instrument uh, that was involved at the end portion of the composing of his opera Tristan. And we heard Tris, parts of Tristan, right? We heard that we heard the Liebes tote out of Tristan. So it may have been on this very instrument that that Wagner uh, uh, composed part of that music. Uh, where is this instrument today? Right down the street. It's in that same collection of, of historical musical instruments. This is what we call the Wagner piano over there on Hill House Avenue. So pop in someday to 17 Hill House Avenue, go up to second floor, and you can see all these historic instruments. It's the greatest collection of keyboard instruments in the entire Western Hemisphere right here, and, and it's virtually unknown. So that's Wagner's piano. What's of interest is, see how those lines are going straight out to the back? Um, it, they're, they're simply braces helping, helping the soundboard there, uh, and the strings are running at right angles uh, to uh, the, the line of the keyboard. Um, but things didn't stay that way, interestingly enough, because as time went on, there was a German manufacturer, this is actually a Beckstein. There was a, another German manufacturer, however, with the name of Steinweg, who immigrated to the United States and set up in New York City. And of course, that Steinweg became what? Steinway, Steinway Piano Manufacturers of New York City. Uh, and they instituted uh, a couple of things, but most importantly, they instituted this idea of cross stringing, where instead of having the bass strings run out in a straight line, they took them and run, run them up over, and next time you're at a grand piano, maybe come up afterwards today, look at the bass strings. They run up over the other strings. What this gives is a much more homogenous kind of sound. It's a much more homophonic instrument. Ironically, the Wagner piano, when you play it, is very clear. You don't get this kind of wash of sounds because the, because the strings are, as you can see, a little bit more separated. And here, this may be our last slide, is what we end up with at the piano, a sort of gilded Steinway from the Gilded Age. This is actually up in the Clark Museum, Williamstown, Massachusetts. But it is, it is a Steinway piano. And you can see on it three pedals, and this is my last point. Uh, initially, all the panels up into the Steinway there, you saw just two pedals underneath. And these are the two we're going to talk about today. The rightmost pedal is called the sustaining pedal. Play that, and um, uh, the sound goes away because there are dampers. There are pieces of felt up on top of the string. But I can lift all those pieces of felt, those dampers, just by pushing that pedal down. Then I get. So the dampers are now up. So we call this the sustaining pedal 
or the damper pedal, sustaining pedal more often. And the other one is the one all the way to the left. And it, you can, what's happening here? AJ, look at the keyboard here, if you will. What, what's happening? Can you see what's happening to the keyboard as I push that left pedal? Chris, Daniel? Yeah, it's wiggling. It's going this way. What's happening is these groups of units of three strings are all sliding so that when you hit the that way, you're, now instead of hitting three strings, you're hitting only two strings. It makes the sound softer by shifting the whole uh, keyboard and hammer mechanism so only two strings are engaged instead of three, and that makes the sound a lot more quiet. All right, uh, that does it for the, um, uh, the uh, specifics of today. Let's in, uh, introduce our guest. So Dan, come on up, please. Uh, Daniel Schlossberg, junior Yale College. What college? Is it Pearson, Daniel? Yeah, he's in Pearson. Uh, how many of you know Daniel? Brantford. Brantford. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's right. I guess that was, was in Brantford. Um, I heard a recital of him in Brantford. Um, so Dan is a junior now. He's a music major, right? You're a music major. Um, any double majors, anything like that? Or just, no. no, okay. Sometimes, you know, Ken shows out there doing microbiology and music, but, um, but Dan is also a composer, right? Dan does a lot of composing, so he's really into music in the series. Do you, do you do any conducting, Dan? Uh, a little bit. A little, a little bit of conducting. Um, and maybe at the end of the semester it'd be fun when we get to modern music to have Dan, do a piece by Dan, bring in a piece by Dan, we could have him come back as guest, uh, guest composer. Uh, so how long have you been playing piano? Uh, first grade, I think. All right, okay, first grade, six, seven, something like that. Um, uh, are your parents musical? Uh, not at all. Not at all? No, I mean, they play piano. And oh, well, that's kind of musical, right? But they're, so they're not professional musicians. Um, and uh, any relatives uh, in music at all? Not really. Uh, so, um, and, and, and I, I hate to embarrass people, I'm, but this is something that fascinates me. Your ear, um, I, it's, I always think you've you got to have a really good ear to be able to do what, what you do. How good is your ear? Uh, well, in terms of like perfect pitch, absolute pitch. Presumably you don't have absolute pitch. No, no. I don't have absolute pitch. Uh -huh. But I, 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 I have pretty close, and like sometimes, I mean, uh -huh. I Okay, so if we played something for you and told you what the first note is, you would get the, the notes there I mean, after. I mean, if, if you just played a note, I could also identify it on the piano, definitely. Oh, really? How interesting. So you do have absolute pitch for, and I think this is true, that some brains are wired for absolute pitch with particular instruments. I get pretty close on the trumpet because I was in the fourth grade, I had to play in a you know, band kind of thing, play the trumpet. Um, so if, if at a young age you get locked into some instruments, those particular pitches can stick, stick with you. That's interesting. So almost absolute, absolute pitch here. So that's one thing I wanted to ask you about because if you have a sense of pitch and if you hear, you know, if you know that and playing a piece, if I go out there, I mean what happens when somebody plays a piece of music? Lots of things are going on. Why do I, Craig, have memory lapses? <coughs> when Dan probably doesn't have memory lapses. Because he probably has a better ear, he can remember this more, he can stream it out there, and he knows, he hears that inside of his head. Yum. And he knows, oh, that's probably an A. And if I want that sound, I know to go to that particular spot. I'm not sure what the sound is in my head, and I sure don't know quickly, instantaneously, where that thing is. And this stuff is going by blazingly fast, so your mind's got to be wired for it to begin with. I think it, it's a huge benefit to have a really good ear, <coughs> even if you are a pianist. Uh, another question. Do you ever get nervous when you play, Dan? Uh, yes, all the time. All the time. <laughs> really? Uh, think about that. Nerves and performers. Jacob, do you ever get nervous when you play? Absolutely. Uh, you take drugs, Jacob? <laughs> Recreationally, pharmacologically? <laughs> um, 
Actually, musicians, anybody ever heard of this? Musicians do take uh, drugs for this, beta blockers to kind of relax them, to lower their heart rate. French horn players, I have a friend who's a professional French horn player, uh, just to, to kind of get you to settle a little bit. Because if you play these instruments, and, and it's just a question of fraction of an instant, and you're like this, my God, a string player, it's a catastrophe. And then things start going downhill. <laughs> uh, so these are the kinds of, of mind games, I think, that performers uh, have, to, have to engage. So do you, you take uh, lessons here, Dan, at the School of Music. Are you studying with anybody there? Okay, um, he is one of the, the artist teachers over at the uh, School of, of Music. Uh, do you get any time to practice? This is a busy place. Hardly. Hardly. No, no time to practice. That's, that's the great dilemma for Yale, uh, really good performers at Yale. There's just no time to, uh, uh, to practice. What do you want to do? What do you think you want to do with this music business? Uh. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to connect the dots? How are you going to get from Dan here, point A, to Dan here 10 years from now? How, how do you plan to do that? Uh, grad school. Definitely. Probably grad school. Yeah, you got to, for better or for worse, you got to get the, the diploma. You know, the certificate says I can do this. You don't, it's, it may, may or may not make you any better, but you sort of have to get it uh, to, to get the, it may, may make you worse, I don't know. You sort of have to, to get it to get the gig. Uh, okay, so let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about this Beethoven uh, Sonato we've got here. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting piece uh, because it's so short yeah. in a way. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So ten minutes, uh, and um, it. When you went to the, how many of you went to the J.E. Makeup concert? Okay. Remember that Eighth Symphony, and and uh, how how quickly that went through Sonata Allegro form. There was a period with Beethoven uh, about 1810 or so. We started writing very small things again after the Fifth and Sixth Symphonies, and then they sort of pulled back and wrote kind of almost neoclassical things. And then at the end of his life, really expanded out into the realm of the cosmos. So this is a kind of pulling back here. Um, what's hard in this piece, Dan? What what what? Um. It's so condensed that you really have to invest everything into each note. I mean, it's, with, with some Beethoven, it's so long, you have to think a lot more in terms of a broader scale. But in this case, there's the phrases and the, the musical ideas are so condensed that you really have to focus mm -hmm. hard mm -hmm. and make appropriate contrasts quickly, uh, et Okay. Um, technically, is this the most difficult piece that you have ever played? From a sheer, sheer. Okay, yeah. Well, we get, we have another one. We have another one. Uh, in other words, this is not a dazzler. This is not a dazzler. We've saved a bit of a dazzler for, for the end of this because I did want to show you how well this young man plays. Um, so let's just listen to the Beethoven. Uh, then, do you want to do? Um, I beg your pardon. Yeah, let's not let's not do it. We're going to let the cat out of the bag here. He's not going to repeat the exposition. Or, Right. Uh, actually, if you look at the score, Beethoven wanted the development and the recap also repeated. But I think in order to get the next um, more technically demanding piece in, we're just going, Dan is kind enough to do it just without repeats. I don't mean to upstage him here, but I'm just going to, we, we have to sort of teach as we do this. It can't just be a, a concert. So I'm just going to discreetly point where we are in the form.
Okay, a wonderful piece. Again, Beethoven sort of pulling in just a bit there and a wonderful performance. Um, I think we have time now for uh, the second piece, which is by the composer Scarlatti. Uh, in the Baroque period, Handel, Bach, Scarlatti were all composing in the same period, all composing in the same period, uh, all born in uh, 1685. Uh, this piece is a sonata by Scarlatti. It's in one movement. It goes by rather quickly. Shall we take, uh, maybe we should skip repeats here too, if, if, that, if that's okay. So it has a binary form. We have an A section and then a B section, and then both of those binaries are going to come back again. I'll, I'll sort of, no, I won't do that. It's just in the, in the way. But the A section has lots of this kind of Spanish quick sound, and the B section, you'll hear a rising sequence coming up out of the bass.
Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, that's it for today. See you in section starting tonight.